a well-known Christian author wrote this, quote, the proof of Christianity is not a book but a life. The power of Christianity is not a creed or a statement of beliefs, but a Christian character. And whenever you see a life that has been transformed by the grace of God, you see a witness to the resurrection of Christ, end quote. This morning, uh, our text addresses a question which I'm sure all have had, and that is, what does Christ-like living look like? Does God's word give us any hints, any behavioral standards? Well, we press on this morning with our series in the book of Ephesians, and the title for today's message is Christ-like Living. And our text is found in chapter 4, from verse 17, all the way over to chapter 5, verse 21. So we have a lot of real estate to cover this morning. Before I begin, I want to share with you a, a schematic which explains where we have been in this sermon series and where we are going. <clears throat> Okay, can you all see this? All right. Basically stated, the book of Ephesians is, has six chapters. The first three chapters deal with beliefs, and there are only two commands. Then the last three chapters deal principally with behavior, and there are over 60 commands. So the last three chapters of Ephesians, where we find ourselves, is largely concerned with the subject of Christian ethics. <clears throat> so today's reading from God's Word is a comprehensive explanation of what it means to live a life that is Christ-like. In fact, the entire text can be simply understood as an explanation or a commentary on what Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 1. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And so Paul is here moving to the heart of Christian ethics. Now, why are Christian ethics important? Well, because a Christian life well-lived makes it easier for people to believe in God. What does God expect a Christian life to look like? Well, Paul explains fully in these verses. Living this new life as a follower of Jesus means turning your back or turning away from your former life of sin. Further, it means embracing the new self that has made you a part of Christ's new creation. <coughs> Put otherwise, you are dealing here with Christian conduct. You are dealing with the practical outworking in your daily actions of the new life that God has given you. How does Paul pull all this critically important teaching together? Well, let's begin with an outline of this morning's uh, sermon, which follows along with Paul's teaching. The first part is a new life in Christ nullifies and replaces old sinful ways. And under that part, we consider specific ways, specific sinful ways to be eliminated and specific virtues to be emulated. Then in part two, we're going to look at living in the light is better than living in the dark. And part three, living wisely is better than living unwisely. So it is that the big idea of this morning's sermon is this. Christ-like living impacts every part of your lives as you 
Put off your old self and put on your new self. <laughs> we begin with verses 17 through 24. A new life in Christ nullifies and replaces old sinful ways. I'm not asking you to stand this morning. Normally we stand for the reading of God's word, but I've broken the text up into a number of pieces, and I don't want you going up and down like a jack-in-the-box. So you, you can stay seated while I, while I read. Verses 17 through 24. <coughs> so I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in the true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> Paul begins here by criticizing the pagan way of life, uh, especially the terrible lifestyle of the pagan world. He goes on in verses 18 and 19 to list no fewer than eight descriptions of the dreadful condition of those who are caught in the life of sin. They are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God. They are ignorant. They have hard hearts. They are insensitive. They have given themselves over to sensuality. They indulge in every kind of impurity. They are full of greed. But what a difference finding Christ makes. The antidote to a life of debauchery and excess is to reject the old lies of the world and to embrace the, the eternal truths of Christ. The answer can only be found in Christ. And note here the emphasis on teaching. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 21. Uh, you, quote, were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You see, teaching is at the heart of our life together as a church. It's at the heart of it. In Acts 2, verse 42, there are listed what are commonly called the four pillars of the church, which include apostolic teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. All four of which we're going to do this morning, by God's grace. Apostolic teaching, no, I'm not an apostle but I'm teaching from what the apostles taught, then we've already had prayer and we're in a break of bread. That's the Lord's Supper. We're doing that after the service and fellowship. Now, what appears first here? Uh, apostolic teaching. It appears there because it's the, uh, 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 of its importance for the Christian life. In, in verses 20 through 24, Paul reminds his readers of three ethical steps the Ephesian believers have been taught. Put off the old, be made new, and put on the new. All right? Now, until you have followed through on all of these, you cannot pretend to be living God's way. In an unintentionally symbolic way, this is what happens at the rescue mission in Chicago where I volunteered for many years. There we used to work with the homeless, the addicted, coming off the street, and many of whom, they arrived at the mission after they heard the gospel, they prayed to receive Christ as their savior. 
then they would be admitted to a program to assist them with their recovery. Now, this would entail the person who was living off the street coming in, taking off all of his or her old, nasty, smelly clothing, which would be burned. Then they would take a hot, soapy shower. Then they would be given new clothes to put on. Sinful corruption is a process, a rotting of the senses that occurs when sin goes unchecked. You see, sin is like gangrene. It atrophies, and then it eats away at your arms and, and legs. And it can only be stopped. It can only be stopped by cutting away the offending flesh. The process of temptation takes place through our deceitful desires, those self-centered impulses that seem so good in the beginning. If you're like me, you can look back on your life in sinful conduct in which you participated, and you can remember that at the time you first did it, oh, this is okay. No harm, no foul. This is pretty good. Okay? That's the way sin is. It starts out that way. <coughs> but in reality, these deceitful desires are a pack of lies that would destroy us. After the old filthy garments have been discarded, it's time to be clothed with the new self, verse 24. This passage summarizes the complete doctrine of sin and, and salvation. As unbelievers, you were under the power of sin and death, enslaved by your senses and doomed for eternity. There was no hope for you. Then God intervened and sent his son to die on the cross to bring redemption and forgiveness. You enter that blessed state of redemption through the three stages that Paul lists here. You first get rid of that old nature by turning to and embracing Christ. Next, Christ makes you a part of his new creation and gives you a new mindset. Finally, you clothe yourself with that new reality and live a life of growing in righteous behavior and conduct. Hence, do you see it here? Put off the old. Be made new. Put on the new. Moving on to verses 25 through 31, there are specific sinful ways or vices to be eliminated. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Paul now presents specific ethical advice on how believers are to move from the old Adam to the new Adam, the, the new self. 
Paul offers a list, and obviously this list is not exhaustive, but he offers a list of concrete sinful ways or vices to be avoided. Verse 25, stop lying and tell the truth. Paul here addresses the result of that core lie, a, a, a pattern of falsehood that may define your life. Researchers explain that all are prone to tell many hundreds of lies every week. Every week. They range from minor untruths, like saying, oh, I'm doing great, when you're not, to small and large deceitful business practices, or really serious things like cheating on your spouse. Jesus tells you in John 8, verse 44, that Satan is, quote, the father of lies, and, is, and to fall into such patterns are to become a child of the devil. The next sinful way, verse 26 through 27, stop being angry and gain control. Paul realizes that in the sinful world there will always be anger. There are times when anger is necessary. The righteous and holy wrath of God against sin is a constant theme throughout Scripture. In the Gospels, for example, you read how Jesus felt anger at the stubborn hearts of Israel's leaders. When the religious leaders criticized Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, you read in Mark 3, verse 5, he, Jesus, looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. However, humanly speaking, your anger must not be allowed to linger and fester, for it can turn into resentment and bitterness. That is why Paul says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not devil a foothold. Satan will use anger in a church community yeah, to destroy its unity. When anger turns into bitterness, you are giving Satan an opportunity to defeat you spiritually and to de decimate your family and your church. The next sinful way, verse 28, stop stealing and work hard to help others. Well, this prohibition, of course, merely restates the eighth of the Ten Commandments. Thou, you shall not steal. The next sinful way, verse 29 through 30, stop foul talk and build up others. Now, the Greek word here translated as unwholesome talk means to something that is filthy or rotten. The category obviously includes dirty jokes, but it is broader than that. Paul has in mind slander and backbiting, using your tongue to abuse and to put down others. The answer instead is for you to utter, verse 29, what is helpful for building others up. Verse 30, Paul concludes the list of sinful ways by warning against grieving the Holy Spirit. All of these sinful ways are detestable to God. So Paul concludes his list of sinful ways of the flesh by issuing a warning. Warning that those who surrender to them will experience the displeasure of God. The justice and the wrath of God are in view here. Verse 31, Paul lists five vices that stem from anger and need to be removed from the life of God's people. Apparently, Paul believed that anger was a dangerous problem in the Ephesian church. In verse 31, he begins with, quote, get rid of. 
If you have ever been in a leadership position in a church, you know that this is easier said than done. <clears throat> I have lived through, in my life, I've lived through deadly tornadoes, devastating ice storms, typhoons. I've lived through two 10 signals here in Hong Kong. But none compares to the destructive power of rage in families as well as churches. Unchecked bitterness has fractured many relationships and destroyed churches, and the problem is rarely handled well. Note how the order of these five vices listed here increase in intensity. You go from bitterness to rage and anger to brawling and slander. And all of them are fueled by malice. Bitterness and rage, these are internal attitudes. And they give way to brawling, which is an external behavior. Underlying all of these actions in verse 31 is every form of malice. Because of the potential for widespread destruction in the church, this is why Paul counsels in verse 26, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Paul now turns from the sinful ways, the vices listed in verse 31, to the three virtues listed here in verse 32 that are to be emulated. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God." These virtues depict the opposite of vices. These are the outworking of love within the community. Yeah, you note that there's a progression here, just as there was in verse 31. That is, a kind heart, what does it lead to? A kind heart leads to compassion. And then what? That leads to forgiveness. These are attitudes and practices designed to produce harmony in the church. A kind or tender heart cannot give in to anger, for it is always thinking of the good of others. And when hurt, will seek reconciliation rather than vengeance. A follower of Jesus' motivation a follower of Jesus' motivation to be like this is found in verse 32. Quote, just as, Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, think of it this way. When you forgive, you forgive one sin at a time, right? But God forgives your lifetimes of sin. When you have experienced the unbelievable mercy and grace of God and realized that Jesus took your place on the cross to forgive your sins, it should be easier for us to forgive others. They can never hurt you as much as you have hurt God. Following on in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Paul admonishes the Ephesian church to, quote, be imitators of God. The indescribable love of God is the basis for everything Paul has said in this letter. Despite your finite and undeserving natures, you can love others only because you have already experienced the genuine love of God and Christ. And the blueprint that defines what this means is, quote, as Christ loved us and gave himself 
up for us. Romans 5.8 says that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Is that not the epitome of love? A sacrifice not for friends or loved ones, but for those who have rejected him with their whole lives. One of the primary themes, themes that runs through Ephesians is the unity of the church as a new creation in Christ. Paul makes it clear that vices fracture relationships and disrupt the church. On the other hand, virtues maintain peace and bring people together as the family of God. Do you know what a porcupine is? Has anybody here ever seen a porcupine at the zoo or something? Yeah, okay. Porcupine, it, 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 it's, a small, it's a small animal, but it's got all these bristles on it sticking out like this, okay? Well, people in the church are kind of like, at times, porcupines trapped outside in a snowstorm when it's very, very cold. How is that? Well, we need each other to stay warm. But we prick and hurt each other if we get too close, just like the porcupines out in the snowstorm. Therefore, in every respect, you must seek Christ's likeness. You must emulate the grace and love of God in Christ in your interactions with each other. Paul now moves on into chapter 5, uh, verse 3 through 14 to demonstrate that living in the light is better than living in the dark. You heard how Paul contrasted vices with virtues. Now he draws an antithesis between the people of darkness and the people of light. As part of the new humanity, followers of Jesus are children of the light. They no longer can have anything to do with darkness. This requires a follower of Jesus' lifestyle to change and to begin to reflect kingdom values. Verse 3 through 14. But among you there must not, not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse, jerk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such, as a, man is, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now are the light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everyone exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul begins here with two primary examples of shameful excess. That is sexual immorality and greed. Back in the, oh, it was actually in, in 79 AD, 
This took place in Italy. There was a, a city of Pompeii, and a volcano next to their Pompeii erupted, Mount Vesuvius. Now, the effect of that volcano was to dump some three meters of volcanic ash on the city. This had the effect of preserving much of the architecture of Pompeii, which has been a gold mine over the centuries for archaeologists trying to find out what life was like back in 79 AD in Pompeii. <clears throat> well, do you all know what a mural is? A mural is like a, a, a painting uh, uh, that covers the entire wall. Well, the archaeologists in digging around here, they found that in, in many of the homes, there were pornographic murals, all right? This tells you where their minds were, all right? Think about it. You go home today to your flat, and an entire wall is covered with pornography, all right? That's what it was like. Because uh, um, sexual profligacy, that was the expectation of Roman men. However, the New Testament frequently and clearly condemns immorality, which may be defined as sexual activity of any kind outside the bounds of marriage. Christian act attitudes towards sexuality were and still are counter-cultural. Paul feels so strongly about this that he says there should not even be a hint, a hint of sexual immorality among the Ephesians. Paul then moves on from lewd conduct to lewd speech. This has often been translated as a prohibition against dirty jokes and vulgar conversation. In place of such unsuitable speech, conversation should be characterized by thanksgiving and with a mind filled with gratitude to God. Paul then warns believers in verses 5 through 7 that those who try to live in both worlds, you know, Going to church on Sunday, but back in the world on Monday. You know, that these are what you might call schizophrenic Christians. And Paul warns that such schizophrenic Christians have no place in God's kingdom. But understand this. Paul cannot be saying that anyone who fails into, falls into sin is apostate. For if that were the case, no one would make it to heaven. The Apostle John, writing in 1 John, he tells us, you know, he, he sets, he sets a, a road map there for us. He says, if, if, anyone, if anyone confesses their sin, God is faithful and just to forgive the sin. Okay? Right. So there's the, ex, and, and he goes on to say that anyone who says they haven't sinned is a liar. So yeah, we're followers of Jesus. We've been born again. We've been washed clean with the blood of Christ. But the reality is, day in and day out, we continue to do sinful things. All right? Now, it's important to note, however, that it's one thing to fall into sin. But it's quite another to engage in an ongoing pattern of sinning. Yet even there we must acknowledge an exception, a caveat. Most followers of Jesus struggle in one way or another with what you might call a prevailing sin. A prevailing sin is one that frequently conquers or holds sway over you. One you cannot seem to convincingly defeat despite how hard you try. The key here is this. You must resist and not persist in sin. You must not give in to it 
or allow to control you. Now, there are some prevailing sins, pornography, drugs, sexual pro 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 being a sex addict, <laughs> alcohol, which may in fact be addictions. For those, you must seek help. And as your pastor, if you need help, permit me to help you. Or if you require professional assistance, permit me to point you in the right direction. So Paul began what amounts to an essay on the Christian life. He began by showing how the new life in Christ he has nullified and replaced the old ways. He then detailed the vices that must be removed from people's lives and the virtues that must be emulated in the church. Next, he went deeper by using light-darkness dualism to show how the light exposes the deeds of darkness and enables the believer to walk in a way that pleases the Lord. He now brings this ethical section to a climax by concluding that living wisely is better than living unwisely. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The key here is uh, found in, in uh, the key in this paragraph is found in verse 18 where it says, "Be filled with the Spirit." The Holy Spirit, of course, who gives you the, the strength to say no to those temptations of the flesh and to live the Christian life. The spirit-filled life also leads to joy in worship speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so it is that the practical outworking of this spirit infilling process in the church, in the lives of its members, is here in speaking, singing, making music, giving thanks, and submitting. So as we close this morning... And as we conclude our study of Paul's essay on the Christian life, please remember the big idea of this morning's message, that Christ-like living must impact every part of your lives as you put off the old self and put on the new self. And may I make a suggestion? Tonight... Before you go to bed, look at your hands. Look at your hands and ask these questions. What did I do to Jesus today? What did I do for Jesus today? What did I do with Jesus today? You only need to look at your hands. And this is the best way to examine your conscience. Let us pray. Dear Father, help us put off the old self and put on the new self. Help us resolve by your grace to permit Christ-like living to impact 
every single part of our lives. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.